Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Welcome back, everybody. Interesting conversation we're going to have today with a gentleman who is somebody that is very plugged into business ethics. He's taught it. He's researched it. He's done many papers on that as well. He's been an adjunct professor of business ethics and a senior researcher. Today, we are going to talk about the cell phone and what it's done to our culture in general. He is Ronald Birnbaum. He's back with us again. So great to have you back here, Ronald. How are you? Fine, Steve. Good to see you. You too. Now, this whole topic today spawns out of a best-selling book. Tell us about that. Well, uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, who was a colleague of mine and is, is still there in a very fine form at uh, New York University, has, uh, writ has uh, written a new book called The Anxious Generation. It was number one on this week's bestseller list, nonfiction bestseller list, New York Times bestseller list. Uh, and it talks uh, in general about the uh, the impact of cell phones and other forms of, uh, of electronic communication between uh, member uh, among members of this uh, latest uh, demographic cohort. I believe it's uh, Generation Z, and uh, how. Uh, and the impact it's had. And, and what John has noticed in surveys of all generations, uh, including uh, uh, going back to the boomers, at least, and maybe before, is that there has been a very, very significant increase in, uh, in anxiety mm -hmm. in, among members of those cohorts. Now, they, there's been measured in various uh, different ways by various different surveys. I don't know exactly how or in what way. But the greatest increase has been, uh, as, as you might expect, uh, uh, among the demographic cohort that is now somewhere between uh, uh, 17 and uh, uh, 25, or that was between 17 and 25 when the survey was taken in, uh, in between when the various surveys were taken between 2012 and 2015. I just want to interject here, even with Go that, right ahead. Backing up what you say is the CDC has said that the largest demographic of people who have considered taking their lives are teenage girls, teenagers, dealing with social media, many would assume, uh, that number is right around 50%, 52%. And many attribute it to cell phone use, social media, and all of that. So yeah, it definitely in line with, uh, with what you're mentioning here. And of course, uh, Jonathan is, is very well known and has written uh, a series of books that have documented the progress of these kinds of changes over time over the last two decades uh, or so. Uh, and uh, so I think, you know, all you have to do, basically what Jonathan has pointed out is, or John is, <laughs> as most people know, what he has pointed out is that there has been uh the kind of activity that used to be supervised or semi-supervised i mean the playground for example had boundaries you couldn't get uh emails from uh hollywood there or anything like that website websites of hollywood uh and that there has been a, a total absence of the supervision that used to exist uh, in uh, various different activities, sure. uh, and whereas activities that uh, are surveyed now, uh, rather are uh, under supervision, uh, really maybe don't need it in the, the activities that are not uh, due. I just compare, for example, I had a fanciful uh, thought of comparing uh, one of today's dating apps to the character of that was played by 
Barbara Streisand in the film Yentl and uh, just how supervised uh, courtship once was, mm-hmm. for right. example, compared to now. <laughs> So I, I'm, I, I think this is fantastic. I think there's so much credence in this book and I back it up with, with personal information. I have teenagers, number one, number two, in terms of your point of supervision, it's nearly impossible to supervise all that activity, even to the point of trying to install different apps to filter or regulate the use of cell phones what websites are seen all of that i have tried i think everything out there paid for them i've talked to tech support all of that there's flaws in all of them and i spoke to my friend mike who is high level at ibm so he's a super techie this is what this guy does he's he's got teenagers too and i said mike what what can we do here what I've tried everything. I mean, this is in your wheelhouse. You write programs, you do seminars, you're sought after to talk about cybersecurity, all of this. What do you do? You know what he told me? He said, you talk to your kids. He goes, nothing is going to lock it down. And that's coming from somebody of that level. If it's out there, he would know, or he'd write it. (laughs) But the problem is, or the challenge is, many of the platforms, for example, Apple don't like anybody meshing with their code. They don't want anybody touching what's going on there. So all the features aren't available. And a lot of teenagers can get past it if they want. They can figure it out, how to bypass all of that. So yeah, to your point, there is no supervision. Dating apps, that's a whole other, other topic. A lot of people are frustrated nowadays with those as well because of artificial intelligence. There's a lot of stuff out there that is not real. It's all artificially generated. Well, it's a a widely believed and probably accurate fact that most, if not all, of the great tech moguls will not have let their children have a cell phone. <laughs> but I'm sure they can find a way to get access to it if their parents could invent the whole process. So yeah, yeah, so a hundred percent, yeah. So I thought maybe we'd uh, we'd take a look at our frame, which, uh, as you recall, uh, goes from uh, utilitarianism and uh, basically economics to law and then to ethics to see if there's a way that we might get a handle either on diagnosing the degree of the problem or and optimally some solutions. But... Uh, that, of course, is, as you yourself have seen, sure. uh, firsthand is uh, difficult, if not impossible, at the current uh, at the current moment. And uh, so we start with the greatest good for the greatest number. And there is, uh, at least my observation, is that in terms, uh, there is great good, but it the beneficiaries all receive it in a very very small quantities compared to the amount of harm, enormous harm, sometimes mm. fatal harm. It has done uh, uh, smaller numbers of people. And so the cost-benefit analysis, it seems to me, is not working right now. There may be a way that can be found to make it work, and the incentives for doing so may lie within that uh, particular area. But right now, uh, it's pretty much got us where we are now, which is worse and worse as uh, each year goes on. Mm. Uh, So then we go on to law. Now, uh, law has, uh, you know, has uh, achieved... uh, rather limited success. I would say not so much legislatively, but at the uh, rather, uh, you know, uh, semi-political, semi-public institutions like school boards and and, uh, local school systems and even uh, uh, private schools or whatever you want to call them, that simply say to 
uh, the students, uh, no cell phones. Uh, mm -hmm. 16 is sometimes a cutoff, so sometimes they let them have it for the last two years. But in any event, uh, law has uh, success, but it's it's only limited. And uh, it's enforceable at a, at a more informal level. You can be kicked out of school, but so you just go to another school maybe. Well, you know, so, I, to, to look at your point even closer, there's many parents that don't want to give their children use of a cell phone, especially when they're younger. But now it comes into a security issue where right. they want to be connected with their kids. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can tell your kid, don't use the cell phone unless you're in an emergency. But we know how that's going to go. And we want to know, uh, we also, we want to know when there is an emergency and we want you to have it and use it then. And we want, want to be able to reach you if there's one, an emergency here that you need to know about. Exactly. So it's hard to, uh, you know, balance uh, those considerations. So once again, it seems like uh, we have to deal with uh, ethics and, and look to ethics uh, for some kind of uh, help, if not a uh, uh, solution. And uh, I've used the word before, and we'll use it again, uh, the, mo the word that is generally used uh, among, uh, if you want to call them practitioners or scholars, is uh, virtue. Uh, now, Aristotle identified the four virtues as, uh, or identified four virtues as prudence, temperance, uh, courage, and justice. And the founding fathers were very heavily influenced uh, uh, in this area, uh, and they distilled it into the phrase which we've discussed before, which Lincoln actually used at Gettysburg. Uh, which is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, what do we mean by the pursuit of happiness? Well, uh, another person I've known for some time, uh, Jeffrey Rosen, who's head of the National uh, Constitution Center, has written a book called The Pursuit of Happiness. I went to a, a, a discussion of, with him of his new book uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, once again, we're we need to recognize what the pursuit of happiness means. Hmm. It means uh, it means uh, not feeling good. It means being good, finding ways to be good, not finding ways to feel good. That's the pursuit that we're talking about. Or uh, and uh, hmm. it's. Uh, when you look at it that way, it, you realize that, obviously, when the Founding Fathers talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, they uh, they were not talking about, uh, you know, the kind of uh, things that we read about um page six of the New York Post, which has never been on page six <laughs> in my yeah. lifetime. <laughs> but, yeah. I don't know that you want to be on that page. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're talking about being good. We're talking about what David Brooks has, I think, quite, uh, quite cleverly and quite accurately referred to as uh, eulogy virtues rather than resume virtues. We're not talking about the kind of statements one would find on your CV. We're talking about the kind of statements that might be delivered at your funeral to sum up your life. Can we and, can we go back to what you said before, yeah. the, sure. the virtue of feeling good versus being good? How would you... How would you define that even deeper? Now it's it might seem rhetorical, but you know, being good does that mean for the greater good? Yes, it certainly does. And uh, I might add that what to add an additional element of confusion to it, the thing that 
probably should make you feel good more than anything else is to be good. Uh, otherwise, we're just talking about uh, sort of physical sensations. Right. Uh, we're not talking about uh, the way you actually feel about yourself and about the world around you. Totally. And it's often been said, too, that's why we volunteer. That's why we help others, because we're helping ourselves to feel good, but we are being good by showing a gesture of goodwill. So, yeah, OK. So I, I wanted to make sure that that uh, was clear in terms of the the virtue uh, that we talk about here. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. And I remember uh, as a child uh, reading this uh, uh, very famous book. It was just still in wide circulation. I think Benjamin Franklin, a biography picture book, picture biography of Benjamin Franklin by a, a French fellow, Dolaire. Uh, your children may have read it. You may have read it as a child. <laughs> and uh, on each one of those pages, there's one of... Benjamin Franklin's Proverbs from his Poor Richard's Almanac. And one of the most famous ones is God helps them who help themselves. And when I was I was growing up, and uh, probably until fairly recently, I always thought that, you know, Benjamin Franklin was a, the original conservative type guy. Don't go looking for handouts. Uh, God will only help you if you do the best you can. For yourself. And now when you look at it in the frame you just put it, and with which I totally agree, and so do many other people, you feel best when you are doing your best to make other feel other people do the best that they can. And mm -hmm. I think that was what Franklin was trying to say. And his point of view was better understood and certainly better received in his own time than ours, unfortunately. Yeah, at this at this juncture, as we look at this book, which is a New York Times bestseller, the whole social situation involving cell phones and social media, because they are connected. What do you think overall, Ronald, is this the solution? Is there one? Or, or did we jump so far down the rabbit hole in the last 20 years that there's just no climbing out? What, what are your thoughts overall? Well, uh, I guess I would say uh, that it certainly feels like that, mm. but we have seen this happen before, and sooner or later we claw our way out of it. But for some of us, uh, it may not be in our lifetime. And there's so much connected and intertwined in all of this. Again, back to companies like Apple that don't like other companies touching their stuff, if you will, in terms of code. And there's so much billions of dollars on the line here in terms of advertising. Now, your phone follows you around. I don't mean just uh physically but it follows you around google knows what you're doing google is so they deep tell you once a month what you're doing where you've been <laughs> well it even go yeah uh, yes and it even goes deeper when you do a, a google search it's not just you're typing in some keywords and google's looking <laughs> at it and bringing back the results now it's all based on intent it knows what your intent is based on your search habits, based on your demographics, based on third-party uh, data. You know, for example, if Ronald went searching for a cosmetic surgeon for breast augmentation, hypothetical going here, Google already knows that you're just testing the water. You, you don't want that done. They don't, it knows who you are. It's not just about the typing in. My point here is it goes deeper. It it it's much more deeper than we even imagined. So you know the rabbit hole isn't here. It's like way down here where we are now, um, and you know even to the point of of security on your phone. It's uh, I think a false sense of security in many regards, and even protecting our kids. Uh, I'd love to hear suggestions on how to do that. 
<laughs> to uh, lock your phone down in those in those regards. Uh, do you feel it's just something that we have to better adapt to? It's here, not going anywhere. Better adapt to? Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by adapt. Uh, you don't want to develop uh, you don't want to work at developing tolerance for that sort of thing and say, oh, yeah, I can live with that now that we've, now that we've got it here. Uh, I think you want to be alert to, uh, as, as you, as your previous remarks indicate, you are working at, uh, to be alert to what the potential dangers are that you haven't even thought of or seen directly. And and move proactively to uh, to try to limit them, and this requires a kind of cooperation and mutual, uh, uh, you know, uh, effort uh, on the part of parties with somewhat different interests. But uh, you know, I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes who said. Uh, Government exists uh, to enable people, in so many words, fundamentally different, they can all agree, perhaps mm. somewhat more limited, but at least to some degree. Wow. Um, deep talk today, because it needs to be said. The book again, if somebody's interested in that book, and this is a colleague of yours, yes? Uh, it used to be when I was, uh, I, I've retired, but we see each other now and then at various different functions and affairs, of which I'm sad to say there are many fewer than there used to be anyway. Uh, but yeah, he, he's a good guy, and I was very pleased. To, and it's I don't think it's the first bestseller he's had, but this is number one. Wow, that's really something. It really is, yeah. And especially, you know, a nonfiction bestseller. Um uh, yeah, you don't see a lot of those, especially this type of topic. So it stands to reason that there's interest in this. You know, people are concerned. Well, if ever you wanted proof of the famous idiom that truth is stranger than fiction, you've got it here. <laughs> you know, I've heard that phrase many times in my lifetime, and I've never considered it in that way. Uh, but you are, I believe you're right on target with that one. Ronald, how do we uh, how do we connect? If somebody is interested in sharing a comment, wants to pick your brain on something uh, ethically, how do they find you? G uh, I think you have a Gmail account that you share. Yes, it's Ronald.Berenbein, B-E-R-E-N-B-E-I-M, at gmail.com. And my telephone number, good old-fashioned landline, is 212-831-0645. Uh, <laughs> It's reasonable to think that nobody will be monitoring his phone. Uh, at least we don't think so, but it's easier to do it on a cell phone than a landline. Uh, Ronald, great having you on here. Thanks for all the insight and uh, your thoughts on ethics. And I look forward to next time we get together. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on mytuner-radio.com or search Podcast Business News Network on streama.com and onlineradiobox.com slash US. Take your podcast on the go and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's, it's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org.
and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's going to be okay.